Uh, just give me a second here to get set up. And if you have any, actually, so going forward, if you guys could mute your mics, that would be great. Because I can just hear all kinds of like crunching sounds in the back, which are which are great. But uh, it just makes it kind of unnerving. And then if you have a question, feel free to unmute your mic or feel free to um, to uh, just uh, type it out here. So you can, I'll put here, feel free to ask a question. Oh, hi, Mikey. Uh, I'm giving a class right now. Can, can you come back later? Not right now, honey. Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you can be here, but just be quiet, okay? All right. So, uh, so moving forward, what I want you guys to be aware of is I'm going to try to keep this lecture to the simplest possible bits of what you need to know to move forward in this class. The kind of things that you would be asked on an ACS final, the kind of things that you will be asked on the exam. So um, if there's anything that I deem unnecessary, and these are things that I've, I've taught every time I've done the class, but since just due to the nature of what we're going through right now, I'm going to kind of skip over those things and just boil it down to the most important bits of what you need to know in Chemistry 102. So let's take a look here and talk about um, biologically important disaccharides. So we already covered sections 16.1 to 16.4. So this is kind of where we left off. And we're going to look at a few important disaccharides. So you remember what a monosaccharide is. So that's a, a one unit, you know, sugar. So that's something like glucose or fructose or galactose or nanose or allose. Anyhow, whole family of monosaccharides. Um, but when you take two monosaccharides and you put them together, you end up with a disaccharide. So the name says it all, right? Disaccharides, so two monosaccharides put together. So it says here that the anomeric hydroxyl, so you'll remember that the anomeric hydroxyl is the hydroxyl that is on carbon one. So that anomeric hydroxyl can react with another hydroxyl on an alcohol or a sugar to form what we call a glycosidic bond. And a glycosidic bond is nothing more than a way of saying an acetal that's found in a sugar. So it says here that the water is lost to form an acetal. So a glycosidic bond is just a specific type of acetal. Or another way you could say it is a, it's an acetal that's formed between two sugars. So here's an example of making this molecule here. So this is maltose. And what you need to be aware of is that maltose is formed by um, joining two molecules of glucose. So here it's showing alpha D-glucose and beta D-glucose. And when we make this glycosidic bond, we end up losing water. And that's why they put water, you know, the elements that form water in this pink um, circle here. So we end up forming water. All right. And you notice that we take alpha D-glucose. And why is this called alpha? Because the hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon is pointing down. So that's alpha. And then on my beta D-glucose, why is this called beta D-glucose? Because the hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon is pointing up. So this is beta. So what happens is, is that maltose is formed by an enzyme that actually takes these two glucose molecules and puts them in the right space so that the hydroxyl on carbon one actually does the reaction with the hydroxyl on carbon four because there are other hydroxyls, right? There's one here, there's one here, right? There's one here. But the enzyme specifically aligns the two molecules so that the reaction occurs between carbon one and carbon four in order to form maltose. So what we get is this alpha one four glycosidic linkage. So sometimes we just write it like this, we'll put alpha and we'll put one comma four. Sometimes we put the arrow like this, either way they mean, they mean the same thing. And why do we call this an alpha one four glycosidic bond? It's because the one and the four come from carbon one and carbon four, and the alpha comes from the fact that the glycosidic bond is alpha, right? Coming from this anomeric carbon, it's going down. So since this is down, this is an alpha glycosidic bond, and it's alpha 1,4. And if you're wondering, well, is there such a thing as a beta 1,4? Absolutely there is. And we'll take a look at that um, in another disaccharide that we'll look at later. So a little bit more information about that glycosidic linkage. So the glycosidic linkage joins the two rings. And it can be alpha or beta. Again, this is another example of an alpha glycoside here. And it's because 
um, the bond is pointing down. So if we had, you know, if we had drawn a six numbered ring like this, and I'm going to leave out all the other information. So I'm, I'm not going to put in any other hydroxyl groups, but if I had my bond going up like this, my glycosidic bond going up like that, and if I had my other sugar molecule like this, okay, then in this case, this would be a beta linkage. So this would be beta one four. Okay, so beta one four. And it's because this bond is going up. So this is beta. So beta one four. And again, we'll see examples of alpha one four and beta one four when we look at cellulose later on. So moving forward, a little bit more information about maltose. So maltose is known as malt sugar. So you've probably all heard of malt sugar before. Anyhow, maltose is formed by linking two D glucose molecules together and that alpha um, to give a 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So the things that you need to know that are most important for you in chemistry 102 on this slide are that maltose, maltose is made from two D glucose molecules and they're linked in an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. I'm not gonna ask you to draw this molecule off by heart, but that's what you need to know. All right. Another thing you need to know about glucose is, uh, sorry, maltose is that it's a reducing sugar. So that's going to be very, very important. The fact that it's a reducing sugar. And how do I know that it's a reducing sugar? Well, you might remember that the requirement for a reducing sugar is that it's a sugar that has a hemiacetal. Sorry, that has a hemiacetal in it. And you can see that there's a hemiacetal here because. On this anomeric carbon, it goes carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. So this unit here is a hemiacetal. And whenever we have a hemiacetal, we have a reducing sugar. What is a reducing sugar? It's a sugar that can reduce copper 2 plus to copper 1 plus, right? In the Benedict's reagent, right? Because copper 2 plus is blue and copper plus is red. So beta maltose is a reducing sugar. Also, just to put this bug in your ear, everything that we're going to look at in this chapter will be a reducing sugar except for sucrose. Sucrose, which is table sugar or beet sugar, is not a reducing sugar. So there we go. So what you need to know about maltose, and you also need to know that it is a reducing sugar. So moving on to lactose, so you've probably all heard of lactose because, you know, a large portion of the population is lactose intolerant. In fact, that portion gets larger and larger and larger. As, you, as people get older and older and older. Anyhow, so lactose is formed by joining D-galactose and D-glucose in a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage. Again, this thing here is the same, same thing as saying beta and then one and using the arrow. It's just different ways of writing the same thing. So lactose is found in mammalian milk um, and it can be used as an energy source, but it has to be hydrolyzed or it has to be broken down into glucose and galactose. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But what lactose intolerance is, it's that a person would lack the enzyme lactase. So lactase is an enzyme, and that would be something that I would expect you to know. And in fact, I bet you many people in the class already know that. Um, anyhow, so let's examine the linkages here. So we have our beta D-galactose and our beta D-glucose. Galactose and glucose are very close in structure. In fact, I think I talked about this in our last night that we had together uh, in our face-to-face -face class. The only difference between glucose or beta D-glucose and beta D-galactose uh, is carbon-4, right? In galactose, the hydroxyl is pointing up and in glucose, it's pointing down. Anyhow, what happens is when we form a lactose, um, the galactose, the hydroxyl, on carbon one and the hydroxyl on carbon two, they come close together and they end up losing water and I form a glycosidic bond. And the glycosidic bond in lactose has a beta 1,4 linkage. And why is it beta? Because the bond coming off of the anomeric carbon is going up. So it's beta and it's beta 1,4 because it's between carbon one and carbon four. There we go. Also, lactose is a reducing sugar. Why is it a reducing sugar? Well, there is a hemiacetal in lactose. And where is that found? If you follow my highlighter, it starts on this yellow carbon. So it goes carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. So lactose, again, is a reducing sugar. 
there we go. So a little bit about lactose, a little bit more information about lactose intolerance and what's known as galactosemia. So galactosemia is actually a very serious condition. And that's covered here in these three bullet points. It says, in order for lactose to be used as an energy source, the lactose has to be converted into a phosphorylated glucose molecule. So all you really need to know is that you have to do something to, to galactose in order to, to metabolize it. So galactose has to be you know, converted into some kind of glucose that has phosphorus on it. Okay, fine. So when the enzymes that are necessary for this conversion are absent in a human being, you get a disease that's called galactosemia. And the thing is, that's a very serious condition because it can even, you know, kill a person, okay? Whereas lactose intolerance is not nearly as dangerous. So lactose intolerance is covered down here. And it says people who don't have the enzyme lactate, which is roughly 20% of the population. And again, that increases as the, when, when we get uh, into older subsets of the population. So, um, People that lack the enzyme lactase are unable to digest lactose. And what happens is the lactose actually gets broken down in the, the large intestine, I believe. And when it gets broken down, it's not broken down in the proper way. And it gets converted into gas like carbon dioxide. And that's why people that have lactose intolerance, if they, you know, drink milk or, you know, have ice cream or something that's not made from, from goat's milk, they end up with, you know, gas and cramping or whatever. Anyhow, so let's talk about sucrose. So sucrose is an important disaccharide, and sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. So again, it's the only non-reducing sugar that we look at. So it gives a negative reaction in the Benedict's test. And sucrose is formed by linking alpha-D glucose with beta-D fructose. This is the only one that involves a five-member ring sugar. So we have glucose and fructose. And we have a 1-2 glycosidic linkage. And what's important here is that all the glycosidic bonds are part of an acetal, but you'll see that in sucrose, there is no hemiacetal. And I'll show you that in, um, in the next slide. So sucrose is obviously very important in plants. You've probably all heard of you know, sugar cane and, and, and beet sugar. Anyhow, so um, it's easily transported in the plant circulatory system because because of the high water solubility of sucrose, and if you've ever made Kool-Aid or, you know, uh, put, put sugar in your, your coffee or something, you know that sucrose dissolves very well in water. Anyhow, interestingly enough, we can't synthesize sucrose ourselves. We get it from plants. And in fact, sucrose, you know, it gets kind of a bad rap. And Americans, generally speaking, we, you know, we consume about 100 pounds each of, of sucrose per year. At least that's what I read in the book anyway. And sucrose is really just, you know, used as a sweetener. And people say, well, it's just a form of empty calories, so it's not really beneficial. But it has no deleterious effects that we know of, except for, you know, it actually has an effect on, on your dental health. So you want to be careful with that. Anyhow, so it's linked. There is a direct link to, to cavities. Anyhow, so let's take a look. I don't know why it does that sometimes. Let me just reopen it back to the presenter view. Anyhow, so back to my presenter view. So this is showing the glycosidic bond that's formed in glucose. So, I, sorry, sucrose. So I have my alpha glucose here. We've looked at that many times. And then I have beta fructose down here. So fructose, I don't ask you to draw the structure of fructose, and obviously it's going to be pretty tough for me to ask you to draw a structure at all moving forward. But anyhow, fructose has a five-membered ring, right? You can see that in um, uh, then in uh, galactose, I have a six-membered ring, but in fructose, I have a five-membered ring. Anyhow, so we lose water, we form the glycosidic bond, and you notice the nomenclature for the but the glycosidic linkage is a little bit different. It says alpha-1 and beta-2. And you can probably figure that out already. Well, the reason that we call it alpha-1 is because off of carbon-1, the bond is going down, right? So this is alpha. And then off of carbon-2, this is considered the anomeric carbon in, in the five-membered ring. So this is the anomeric, anomeric carbon. Carbon, okay? Um, it's pointing up here in, in the sucrose molecule. So and it's on carbon number two. 
So that's why we call it alpha one, beta two. What do you need to know about sucrose in this class? You need to know that sucrose is formed from fructose and glucose, and it's not a reducing sugar. That's basically the take home message for chemistry 102. Anyhow, let's see here. All right, so moving forward, let's talk about polysaccharides. So is everybody still with me out there? Because I just got an email from the student in the class, and I want to see what she says. All right. There we go. Let me just take a break here. Back to the teams. So are my students still there? Just I just want to do a check. All right, yeah. I got thumbs up. I got thumbs up. Let's see. We got we got nine people here. Hey, that's a pretty good turn. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've got Elena, Will, Vanessa, Sean, Zach, Danny, Dan, Shannon, Gabby. Okay, that's great. That's a really good turnout. I'm proud of you guys for, for showing up to class under, under the circumstances. That's fantastic. All right. Anyhow, okay. So I'm going to, now that I know that everything seems to work, um, so what I ask I have one small favor to ask of you guys. So this is not for points or anything, but so first I kind of directed this just towards Dan, but if you could help me out after this lecture, once class is over, and if you could just go look in the discussion to see what's going on there, because I get another email, I just received another email from a student who's having difficulty with Teams. If you could just help me out with the technical aspect, I would really appreciate that. Anyhow, with that in mind, let's uh, keep moving forward here. And we'll talk about, uh, so where am I? Share. There we go. So share screen. Podcast. All right. So good. Seems to be working pretty well. And let's move forward. There we go. So let's talk about polysaccharides a little bit. All right. So polysaccharides. So um, we're going to talk about, so if you have your mic on, if you could turn it off, that would be great because I can hear an echo of myself. One of me is enough. In my life, I don't need another one of myself. All right. Da, 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 da. Okay, so um, polysaccharides. So we're going to talk about a few different polysaccharides. We're going to talk about polysaccharides that are found both in plants and in animals. So the ones we're going to talk about that are found in plants are amylose and amylopectin, which are found in starch. And then we're going to talk about cellulose. And then um, we're also going to talk a little bit about glycogen, which is the main storage um, form of glucose in animals. So a little bit about starch, and you've probably all heard of starches. They're um, found in things like potatoes. So starch, starches are the storage forms of glucose that are found in plants, and they are polymers of alpha-linked glucose units. So we see that ubiquitous alpha-linked glucose keeps coming up over and over and over in organic chemistry. So um, there's two... Um, types of polysaccharides that we're interested in when it comes to starch. We're interested in amylose and amylopectin. And you have to know the difference between these. So if we only have alpha 1,4 links between our glucose units, that's amylose. And amylose makes up about 20% of what starch is. And a little bit about the structure of amylose. It says here that amylose usually assumes this helical configuration with six glucose units per turn per term. So I'll show you on the next slide. So this is the structure of amylose here. So it's just a bunch of alpha D glucose units. I know the structure is a little wacky here. They've left out all the hydrogens in here. I don't know why, but anyhow, they did. So those aren't shown here. You could draw them in for fun. Anyhow, another thing that's kind of interesting here is you notice these little angles down here. It kind of makes it look like there's extra carbons in there, but there's there aren't. It's, it's just represented this way. So what happens is when I have my alpha 1,4 linkages in my amylose, it makes this left-handed turn. So the way you can think about the left-handed turn is if you were to take your left hand, right, and point, how many fingers is that? Like four fingers, right? 
So if you were to point your thumb up like this, right, your fingers turn, right, they curl in this direction. So that's why we call it a left-handed turn. In every, you know, one turn, one complete turn like this, you have an average of six um, glucose units in that turn. And if you're wondering what the hell is holding it together, you can probably guess what that is. And it's hydrogen bonds that hold those together. Anyhow, so amylose has one four, um, is one four linked alpha D glucose units. Now, if I have both alpha D one four and one six links, then we have branches and the branches come from the one six links. And I'll show you a picture of that so it'll make sense. Anyhow, and we call that amylopectin. And amylopectin is very close in structure to glycogen. So if you've ever looked at the structure of glycogen, maybe in a biology class, it's pretty close to that. And I'll explain the differences between the two. But what you need to know about amylopectin is that amylopectin is highly branched and it has branches that are pretty long and they're about every you know 20 to 25 glucose units. So let's move on from there. So there's the structure of amylose. Now, if I compare the structures of amylose and amylopectin, you see the amylose has, again, the alpha-1,4 linkages here. So this is something that we looked at already. But a little bit about those um, branches. So I am the vine, we are the branches, right? So here is, this is the main chain, okay? So this is the same chain that you see in amylose, but the branches are coming off here, and these are the alpha 1,6 branches. And if you're wondering, where the heck does alpha 1,6 come from? Well, let's take a look. Well, it's because it's coming from the anomeric carbon, which is carbon 1, and it's alpha because the glycosidic bond from the anomeric carbon is pointing down. And then 6 comes from, this is kind of interesting, it's branched off of carbon 6. So you know that CH2OH that we kind of always left alone? Yeah, that's the one that is used to make the branches. So amylose has no branching, but amylopectin does have branching, and the branches are about every 20 to 25 units. Okay, we'll see a branch. And I have another picture that, that shows you a little bit more detail on that coming up. So let's move on from, um, from uh, amylose and amylopectin and talk about glycogen. So glycogen, is the major storage form for of carbohydrates that's found in animals. So when we store glucose, we store it in the form of glycogen, and we store it in glycogen in our liver and in our skeletal muscle tissue as well. So just like amylopectin, glycogen is a highly branched um, um, polymer in the same type of branching that's found in amylopectin. The only difference is that there's more frequent branching, so more frequent branches, so every 10 monomers or so. And I'll put down here, branches, branches are shorter, the shorter branches. So that's the only difference between glycogen and amylopectin is just the number of branches and the length of the branches. You can take that to the bank. Um, and I have a picture that shows that coming up. Anyhow, the last kind of polysaccharide that I want to look at is the most abundant polysaccharide on the planet Earth. In fact, I think it's the most abundant molecule on the planet Earth, and that's cellulose. And cellulose is the major structural polymer that's found in plants. So if you're wondering where does glucose come from in plants, well, you've probably all heard of photosynthesis. So plants can take carbon dioxide and water, and then they use sunlight to create glucose, and that glucose can be put together to make cellulose. And cellulose is what provides the rigidity in plant cell walls. So if you've ever wondered, like, you know, a tulip or something, like what holds up that flower on the end? The stem is not very big. So there's quite a bit of rigidity associated with plant cell walls. All right. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Danny. If you could tell them what the issue is, that would really be helpful to me. Anyhow, so I'm just reading the chat here while I'm talking. Anyhow, so going back to cellulose. So cellulose is a linear homopolymer composed of beta D glucose that are linked beta 1, 4. And what's interesting about cellulose is that the chains are linear. They're really long and they have these really strong hydrogen bonds um, between all the glucose units. And those are called fibrils. I don't have it in the slides, but it's mentioned in the book. Um, anyhow, so the repeating 
uh, disaccharide that's found in cellulose is cellobiose. So if you were to take cellulose and break it apart into just two, uh, or into two, um, two sugar units, so disaccharide units, those disaccharides are called cellobiose. Anyhow, um, animals that lack the enzymes uh, necessary to break down cellulose, so animals like human beings, um, or sorry, animals lack the enzymes necessary to break down cellulose, but the bacteria that's found in some animals like termites and cows and goats and deer, right? They have bacteria in their digestive system that can break down cellulose. So it's actually not the mammal itself that's breaking down the cellulose. It's actually bacteria that they have in their gut that are able to break that down. And then once the bacteria breaks down the sugar, then the animal can break down or metabolize, I should say, metabolize the sugars. Now, we don't possess those bacteria. So for us human beings, cellulose is just the fiber that's found in fruits and vegetables. Anyhow, so here's the structure. So what you need to know is that cellulose is formed by glycosidic bonds, and it's made from beta-1,4 glycosidic bonds. So it's one, carbon-1 one from the anomeric carbon, and carbon-4, and it's a beta glycosidic bond, right? Because this bond is going up. So it's beta. There we go. Anyhow, so there's the structure of cellulose. So this is just a comparison slide to show you the difference between glycogen and amylopectin. I told you that they're very similar and that they have the same backbone. So they have that same alpha 1,4 linked glucose units and they have the same branches coming off of them. But I told you that in, in glycogen, it has more branches, more branches and the branches are shorter. And that's exemplified in this picture here, okay? So you have more branches and they're really um, a lot shorter. Whereas in amylopectin, the branches are not as frequent. They're every, what, 20 to 25 units, I said, and the branches are a lot longer. They're so long, as a matter of fact, that if you look at the structure of amylopectin, it's actually difficult to differentiate between the main chain and the branches, right? The branches are just so darn long that sometimes it's kind of hard to tell the difference between the two. All right, so this covers the questions that I have posted to D2L. So I would recommend taking a look at all of these. Now, again, going back to our schedule, um, and my schedule is on my wall. So let me take a look at it. So tonight I want to finish this chapter, which we just did. And now I want to spend the rest of the time talking about lipids. And yeah, so if we have any time left over before. Exam four, we'll try to do some review, but that will be time permitting. All right, so I'm going to cease my screen sharing right now, and I am going to find my slides. So if you just give me a few secundos here, and I'll try to find them. So how's everybody doing? Danny, what do you think the problem is? Sorry, I can't hear you, Danny. Your mic's too quiet. Hello. I can hear you, but just barely. Anyhow, if you want to type it out, that's fine too. Sorry, you guys, I'm just trying to find my files here. Lipids files. Go. Alrighty. So there we go. Presenter view. All right. So let me go back to Teams and on my camera. All right. I've already lost all my students. Okay, great. So let's see here. Anyhow, Danny, if you want to post in the, um, it's a permissions error. They use Office under another account. We run into this a lot at work. They just have to sign out. And it should prompt them to sign into the right one. Okay, so if you could post that, uh, Danny, if you could post that into the discussions. So if you go into Chemistry 102, into our, you know, our class D2L page. Um, oh, thanks. Okay, I see that you posted that. I really appreciate that. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for doing that. All righty. Yep, already did. Great. Thank you. All righty. So let's get, so is everything working okay? So far, so good? Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. Perfect. Uh, I love it. I love it when the plan comes together. All right.
But now let's talk about lipids. There, so going into the lipids chapter, I'm just gonna find, I made a bunch of notes here about lipids that I wanted to take a look at. So before we do this, talk about lipids, there is so much information in the lipids chapter that is kind of FYI, like the part about eicosanoids and leukotrienes and thromboxanes, it goes into all this gory detail about things that I would, that I, you will not be asked about. Uh, so again, I just want to put the bug in your ear that as we move forward, I'm going to try to distill this into, you know, the down to brass tacks, you know, what you really need to know moving forward in chemistry 102. All right. So let me do my screen share here. Uh, share. There we go. Share screen. Okie doke. Start broadcast. Broadcasting in three, two, one. All righty. So let's take a look at lipids. All right. Lipids is a great chapter. Uh, not my favorite chapter, not as exciting as something like esters and carboxylic acids, but it's still kind of cool. And the interesting thing about lipids is that, you know, so far, everything that we talked about was always based on functional groups, right? It was like, you know, what's an acid? What's an acid chloride or an anhydride, you know, or an ester, a ketone, right? But lipids are actually um, not defined by functional group at all. Okay, so we're going to see a whole bunch of different functional groups come up in this chapter. So we're going to see esters, we're going to see, you know, um, alkanes, we're going to say uh, alkenes, all kinds of different things. So how do we define a lipid then? Well, a lipid is nothing more than a biomolecule that's just going to be soluble in organic solvents and insoluble in water. If I had to boil this down into the most important thing of what you need to know is that lipids are insoluble in water, right? And if you've ever tried to clean bacon grease with just water, you know that it doesn't work because fats are not soluble in water. So you have to take this part here where it says organic solvents, you have to take that with a grain of salt because when it says organic solvents, I would like to add something to that and I would put nonpolar organic solvents. Okay, so lipids would uh, be soluble in a nonpolar solvent that's organic. So if you're wondering what's a nonpolar organic solvent, um, things like benzene, things like hexane, you know, something that's that's just completely nonpolar. Anyhow, a little bit more about lipids. So it says here that lipids contain many nonpolar carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds and very few polar bonds, resulting in their water insolubility. So remember, if these bonds are nonpolar, right, water is a polar molecule, right? Water is a highly polar molecule. So therefore, that gives you another reason or another rationale as to why lipids are not going to be soluble in water. In fact, lipids have a lot of energy because or there's a lot of energy, I should say, stored in lipids because there's a lot of energy in, in carbon, carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds. So just to kind of break it down into how are we going to categorize or how are we going to differentiate between all these different types of lipids? We're going to break it down into a couple of categories. So we're going to look at hydrolyzable lipids and non-hydrolyzable lipids. So hydrolyzable lipids, those are ones that can be broken apart by hydrolysis, right? Can be broken apart with water. So the ones that we're going to look at are waxes. And waxes are actually a type of ester, so a type of ester. Waxes are probably the easiest kind of lipid to, to recognize. Triacylglycerols. So this is the same thing as a triglyceride. So a triglyceride, glyceride, it's the same thing. So the things that make you know ice cream taste so good. And then phospholipids. And you can probably guess what that is. It's a lipid that has you know a phosphorus on it, right? Let's have phosphorus atom associated with it. Nine hydrolyzable lipids, those are ones that can't be broken down into smaller molecules by aqueous hydrolysis. So non-hydrolyzable lipids. So the ones that we're going to look at are steroids. So you're going to recognize, be able to recognize what a steroid is by the time this is done. And the steroid always has the same kind of carbon skeleton where it always kind of looks like, um, always kind of looks like this. So you, whenever you see this kind of carbon skeleton, that means it's a steroid. In fact, I remember when I was studying organic chemistry way back in the 90s in university and my uncle came to visit me. I have no idea why. 
But my uncle was a pharmacist, and he looked down at what I was studying. He said, Roy, the only thing I remember is how to recognize a steroid. Anyhow, and then the fat-soluble vitamins. Um, if you've ever you know, studied fat-soluble, uh, lipid-soluble vitamins before, you would know that these are A, B, E, and K. It's a good idea to have those memorized. And then eicosanoids. Icos means 20. So these are um, compounds that contain 20 carbons. Anyhow, and we'll talk about what eicosanoids are a little bit. So a little bit more about lipids. So biological functions of lipids. So as an energy source, lipids provide nine kilocalories of energy per gram. So if you compare that to uh, proteins and um, carbohydrates, they only provide about four kilocalories of energy per gram. So lipids provide more energy per gram than carbohydrates and proteins do. And it's because of all of those carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. There's a lot of energy in those bonds. Anyhow, so triglycerides provide the energy storage in adipocytes, so that's a fat cell. Um, and then phosphoglycerides, and then we're gonna look at things that are called sphingolipids and steroids. Those are important because they're the structural components of cell membrane. So you've probably all heard of the phospholipid bilayer. So, so phospholipids, so those are things like phosphoglycerides and sphingolipids. Anyhow, and then steroids are actually part of the that bilayer as well. If you studied, you know, the classic phospholipid bilayer in, in the biology class, you know, they've all done this and the tails and everything. So we're going to look at that in this class as well. And we're going to talk about actually the molecular structure of what's found in that lipid bilayer. And steroids, those are hormones, so they're just uh, chemical messengers. The lipid-soluble vitamins, A, E, D, and K, we'll take a look at their structures, and we'll see a lot of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and we'll, we'll get the rationale as to why they are not water-soluble. Um, and then we'll say, we'll take a look at dietary fat, which acts as a carryable, carrier sorry, of lipid-soluble vitamins. and helps bring them into the cells and into the, uh, of the small intestine. Um, and then, of course, you know, lipids provide uh, some good shock absorption and some insulation for mammals as well. So moving on and talking a little bit more about the classification of lipids. So there's four main groups of lipids. So we have the fatty acids. So we have both saturated and unsaturated fats. So uh, if you've ever studied uh, biology, I'm sure you've heard of saturated fats and unsaturated fats. And in this class, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that. But if you're wondering about why, what, what the heck is a fatty acid? Well, if I have something like this, like Acetic acid. So acetic acid is just your regular run-of-the-mill carboxylic acid, right? But if I have a carboxylic acid that has a really long tail associated with it, and it normally has an even number of carbons, so draw a bunch of carbons on here. This is something that we would call a fatty acid. And if you're like, well, what, what's the difference? Well, the reason we call this fatty is because you remember that a long carbon based tail here, right? This is going to be the fatty portion, right? Because it's all made up of nonpolar bonds. So it does have a polar group on the end, but that polar group is negated in terms of solubility by that long uh, hydrocarbon tail attached to it. So that's what a fatty acid is. Then glycerides, those are going to be like things like triglyceride and sphingolipids. Those are molecules that contain glycerol. So if you remember glycerol, is this thing here. So it's one, two, three trihydroxypropane. So this is glycerol. Everybody who studies organic chemistry should know the study of glycerol. Then we'll look at non-glyceride lipids and we'll, anyhow, and then complex lipids. I'm pretty sure we won't get into that this evening. All right. So this is just another scheme. Let's move on. So it's just, you know, we could sit here and classify lipids all day long. So let's get into the fun stuff. So let's talk about fatty acids. All right. So um, where were we? So fatty acids are long, straight chain carboxylic acids with no branching, like I just drew on the previous slide. So we can draw our carboxyl group, and then they have a long chain. And if you're like, well, how long is the chain? Well, that depends. Right? It can be anywhere from 10 to 20 carbons in length. Usually, it's going to be an even number of carbons, so 12, 14, 16, 18 um, in the chain, including the carboxyl carbon. So all the carbons put together, you add them all up, we almost always get an even number. They can be saturated or unsaturated, but usually no other functional groups are present. So 
saturated or unsaturated. So when it and when a fatty acid is unsaturated, the unsaturation comes from a double bond. So it's going to come from a double bond. And if you're like, well, is that the same thing as an alkene? Yes. So it's going to come from an alkene. So any fatty acid that cannot be synthesized by the body is called an essential fatty acid. So um, we talked about essential amino acids. So those are amino acids that you can't synthesize. And non-essential amino acids, those are ones uh, that we can synthesize. Anyhow, so let's take a look at the structure of some fatty acids. And again, you don't have to have, you know, stearic acid memorized, but you have to understand that fatty acid is just, or sorry, stearic acid is just a typical saturated fatty acid. It's got 18 carbon. So if you were to count these up, right, carbon, carbon one, two, so on and so forth, and they go all the way up to 18 carbons, right? So that's a lot of carbons. And stearic acid is actually, is actually found in tallow, which is beef fat. So if you've ever heard of a steer, right, you can probably draw the connection there between steer and tallow and beef, right? Anyhow, so you have this long um, uh, hydrophobic chain here on the end, and that is going to render stearic acid insoluble in water, despite the fact that you have this carboxyl group on the end. It's just too small compared to the size of that big hydrophobic chain. Oleic acid is a typical unsaturated fatty acid, and it has 18 carbons. And you'll notice that if we count up where the double bond ends, we have carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that double bond starts on carbon 9 and ends on carbon 10. Another thing that you'll probably notice about that double bond is that the double bond is cis. Okay, so it's cis. And if you're wondering, you know, where the heck did the trans fats, when, when do they come into play? Well, we'll talk about that and where trans fats come from. So this oleic acid is a cis fat. So saturated uh, and unsaturated fatty acids. So saturated fatty acids have no double bonds whatsoever, whereas unsaturated fatty acids do contain double bonds. So an example of that would be something like oleic acid. But that double bond in naturally occurring unsaturated fatty acids is almost always cis. Okay, so Cis fats are natural. So double bonds, what they do is they lower the melting temperature of a fatty acid. So the cis configuration, what it does is it does not allow the fatty acids to pack as close together. So if you think about melting point, right? So if you think about, if you were to compare the melting point of stearic acid with that of oleic acid, which one of these do you think has a higher melting point? Somebody can, if you could unmute your mic and answer that, or you could type it out. Which one of these do you think is Steric. a higher? Steric, yeah, absolutely it does, right? Steric acid has a higher melting point. High, pull your high melting point, and this one has a low melting point. And the reason why is, if you remember, when we talked about things like um, alkanes, right, the easier that they could pack together, the higher the melting point was, right? If they can pack together very efficiently, then we're going to have strong intermolecular forces between the two molecules, right? We're going to have a lot of intermolecular forces where if I have two molecules that don't pack together effectively, so let's say I have, you know, an alkene that's got a cis double bond in it, right? And I try to get that to stack, you know, with something else that's got a double bond, right? It's not going to, it's, it's not going to stack it, it's effectively, okay? Anyhow, it kind of looks like it does here, but it doesn't. Anyhow, so since it won't stack together as effectively, especially when you have these, when you have a big long chain like this, it's going to raise the melting point. So an unsaturated fatty acid has one or more carbon-carbon double bonds. The first double bond is usually at carbon nine, okay, almost always. So the double bonds are not conjugated, and they're usually cis. Do you remember what conjugated means? So conjugated. Conjugated is when the double bonds and single bonds alternate. So you have like double, single, double, single, double, single, so on and so forth. So that's conjugated. So the double bonds are not conjugated and they're usually cis. So what happens is, now this is where it would be easier if I was in a face-to-face -face classroom with you guys. I could show you with my hands how, you know, the cis double bonds, they bend the molecule, right? It's got a kink in it, okay? And what that does is it serves to decrease the London forces between um, the fatty acids. So Here's another uh, fatty acid. So this is 
palmitoleic acid. So we go carbon one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this is carbon nine and carbon 10. We have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So palmitoleic acid has 16 carbons in it. Anyhow, so what's going to happen is that melting point is going to increase with the number of carbons, right? Why would that be? The same reason that boiling points got higher and higher when we had an alkane and then we went from propane to butane to pentane to hexane and so on and so forth. It's because of increased London forces. So melting point of a saturated fatty acid is higher than an unsaturated fatty acid with the same number of carbons. So typical saturated fatty acids are going to be packed together very efficiently, right? So saturated, they're going to pack together just fine. Whereas when I have a double bond, okay, so when I have a double bond, it says cis double bonds prevent good alignment in unsaturated fatty acids leading to poor packing. So when I have those double bonds, it leads to poor packing and a lower melting point relative to the saturated fatty acids. So there's some really interesting um, information in this table on this slide. So if you take a look at some common saturated fatty acids that are found here, so as I go from, you know, capric to lauric to meristic to palmitic, stearic, or arachidic, and you don't have to memorize these at all, okay? But you see that the number of carbons is increasing, so we're going from 10 carbons to 12 to 14 to uh, 16 to 18 and 20. So what are we doing? We're just increasing the length of the carbon chain. And remember, these are saturated, so no double bonds. What's going to happen with the melting point, right? They're going to increase. So the melting point gets higher and higher. Nothing really new there. Now, if I look at some um, common um, unsaturated fatty acids, so if I compare... If I compare, so let me see here. If I go from palmitoleic acid to oleic acid and linoleic, linoleic acid, sorry, you can see that what's happening is I go from, you know, what, so if I compare just these two here, so let's compare palmitoleic and oleic. They both have one double bond. Okay, great. But this one, the second one, oleic acid has more carbons in it. So what's going to happen is that the melting point is going to increase. Then if I look at linoleic acid, it has the same number of carbons. So let me get a different color pen over here. So palmitoleic, oleic, and linoleic acid, they all have the same number of carbons. But what's the difference is that now that linoleic has an extra double bond in it. So what happens is the melting point drops on account of that extra double bond. Then if I look at um, something that has a third double bond, what's that going to do? It's going to lower the melting point again. So I go from no double bonds, right, to one double bond, I'm sorry, from one double bond to two, to three, and what happens is the melting point keeps dropping. Anyhow, so, you know, there's nothing really new here. It's more just looking at concepts that we've already studied, but just in terms of fatty acids. So if you're the kind of person that can't live without a graph, no problem, here's one for you. You can follow this line here, the big, line here. So this is all, these are all saturated fatty acids, so no double bonds whatsoever. So what happens as the number of carbons increase, what happens? The melting point goes up. That's it. Now, if we compare a bunch of uh, fatty acids that all have 18 carbons, so each one of these fatty acids, stearic acid, stearic acid, um, oleic acid, linoleic acid, and linoleic acid. Notice the difference between these two, linoleic and linoleic acid. So what's happening? This one has no double bonds. There's zero double bonds. Then I go to one double bond, two, three, and what's going to happen? The more double bonds you have, that melting point is going to drop, and it's because of crummy packing. That's it. All right. So probably all heard of omega-3s. They were really popular um, in commercials a number of years ago. They said, you got to have your omega-3s, you know, and omega-6s. So I can teach you this. Um, I can teach this to anybody in about two minutes. So an omega-3 fatty acids, which are found in, you know, fish oils and flax seeds, recommended as part of a healthy diet. When I first got married, I used to like to eat kippers, but my wife put the kibosh to that. Anyhow, and, and they're, they're loaded with omega-3s. So it doesn't matter what kind of fatty acid you have. Okay, so you look at the carbon chain of all these different fatty acids. So here's the carbon chain. The last carbon 
in whatever fatty acid you're dealing with, doesn't matter if it gets 40 carbons or, or 18 carbons, the last carbon is called the omega carbon. So this symbol here, this is omega, okay, the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So you count backwards from the last carbon, from the omega carbon. So you count back one, two, three. If you have a double bond on that third carbon coming back from the omega, it's an omega-3. So here's omega, one, two, three. We have a double bond, that's an omega-3. We have one, two, three, that's an omega-3. I think that's a question on the ACS final. Now, whether or not you're going to just write the ACS final, that's kind of up in the air, but it is one question that I do have memorized. All right, so um, all you need to know is that omega-3s are good for your health. Let's skip blood clots and everything else. An omega-6, so an omega-6 is, you know, to determine whether a fatty acid is omega-6, you do the same thing. You start at the omega carbon, which is the one on the end. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six. If I have a double bond on carbon six, it's an omega six. So the same thing applies here. So this is linoleic acid is an omega six. And linoleic, or sorry, arachidonic acid is uh, an omega six. Arachidonic acid, you don't have to memorize this or anything, but arachidonic acid is really important in the synthesis of a lot of biomolecules. I mean, that's beyond the scope of our class, but just something that might, you might find interesting. All right, so I'm going to kind of distill this into the simplest possible bits of what you need to know. So eicosanoids. So these are um, compounds that have 20 carbons in them. So that's what eicos means. So eicosanoids. So 20, 20 carbons. Anyhow, in the three types of eicosanoids that you need to be aware of, I guess, are prostaglandins. Sometimes we call prostaglandins the PGs. The prostaglandins are the PGs, PGs. Um, leukotrienes and thromboxanes. Look, all you have to be able to do is pick them out of a police lineup. That's it, okay? Nothing more than that. So fatty acids, which cannot be synthesized by the body, we call those essential fatty acids, and linoleic acid is considered an essential fatty acid. And linoleic acid is required to make arachidonic acid. And then, like I told you, arachidonic acid is the precursor to make a lot of different compounds. So eicosanoids are made from arachidonic acid. So the three main groups of eicosanoids are the PGs, the leukotrienes, and the thromboxanes. Again, I'm going to try to distill this into the simplest possible bits. Look, prostaglandins are important biological molecules. But they have so many biological functions that it gets really difficult to keep them all straight. So very important biological molecules. They act like hormones in controlling um, the body's processes. What you need to be able to do is recognize the structure of the prostaglandin. That is what I think is most important. And all prostaglandins have a five-membered ring. So they all have a five-carbon ring, right? And you can all recognize five-carbon ring. That's not hard to recognize, right? So they all have something like that. And the names are based on the ring substituents, and there's a naming system that's used to be able to differentiate between all of the prostaglandins. So it's based off of the substituents on the ring and the number of double bonds. So now the biological thing here, it says made in most tissues and exert their effect on cells that produce them and the cells that are close to them as well. And it says here, made in most tissues. I mean, this is where it gets really complicated. And it even says that here in the slides, and it says it in the book. It can be difficult to keep track of the many regulatory functions. So I'm not going to beat the heck out of that at all. I'll just say they have a lot, they're involved in a lot of biological processes like blood clotting, inflammatory response, um, the reproductive system, GI tract, kidneys, respiratory tract. I'm not really going to ask you anything. Uh, deep about this. I'm going to leave it up to you to read this section. It's rare for me to do that, but it just goes into so much detail. It's, it's about 10 minutes of reading at, at most. Anyhow, but what's most important, I'm going to try to leave for review. And since we are on a limited time schedule, I'll kind of move on to that. Now, more about the structures of the prostaglandin. So we use PG to represent, P, to pr represent prostaglandin, and then we use a third letter, and that represents the substitution pattern. So this comes from another book, but I thought it was pretty helpful. So we have PGA, PGB, PGC, PGD, PGD, so on and so forth. 
So if you see, for example, let's look at PGC. So we, you notice what they all have in common, right? They all have the five membered ring. So they all have this in common. It's just the substitution on it. So if you have, you know, this carbonyl here, and you have this double bond, and you have two groups coming off of it like this, and then you have this group coming down, that tells you it's a PGC, right? So you have to have these memorized or something. You do not have to memorize these in any way, shape, or form. Just know what the, the letter means. And then we follow that by a subscript number. And that subscript number refers to the number of pi bonds in the molecule. So let's look at an example. So if we have PGE2, so PGE2, so here's the molecule, PGE2. It says here it regulates muscle contraction during labor. So why is it PGE? Well, if you look at the structure of the PGE, you can see that it's the same as what we see here. Okay, it's identical. And then how many double bonds do we have? Well, we have a double bond here and a double bond here. So that's why we put a T, because there's two double bonds. And that basically describes what you need to know about prostaglandins. So there's, these are the structures of some other prostaglandins. You can take a look at these if you want in your spare time and look at, you know, why are these um, PGEs? Why is this a PGF? Anyhow, let's move on from there. As far as the structure of thromboxanes and leukotrienes go, uh, I don't think I'm going to ask you a whole heck of a lot about these. Just know that they're icosinoids. They have 20 carbons. And why would these be considered lipid? Yes, they have things like hydroxyl groups and carboxyl groups in them and carboxylates. But what are they mostly made of? Right? They're mostly made of just a carbon-hydrogen skeleton. Right? It's mostly just carbon-hydrogen bonds. It's most of what the molecule is. So that's why these are going to be insoluble in water. All right, um, a little bit about aspirin and prostaglandin. So aspirin, what it does is it inhibits prostaglandin synthesis by acetylating um, an enzyme known as cyclooxygenase. So I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of a COX inhibitor, but cyclooxygenase, we abbreviate that as COX, C-O-X, and it's required for prostaglandin synthesis. So let me just back all the way up here. So if you go in here, it says prostaglandins are involved in inflammatory response. So they mediate aspects of inflammation. So if you can block prostaglandin synthesis, you can mediate uh, inflammation and the pain associated with inflammation. So the way that aspirin works, so here's our aspirin molecule. And again, I'm asking you to do only a part of the aspirin lab, but aspirin has this methyl ester in it and what the, it does is aspirin takes this hydroxyl group on the active part of cyclooxygenase and it co converts it to a methyl ester and what it does is it inactivates the enzyme and that blocks the synthesis of the prostaglandins that cause pain so that's how aspirin works which is kind of interesting anyhow um there's nothing that you need to know from this slide, except that just know that arachidonic acid is used as a precursor in the synthesis of many biological molecules like leukotrienes, um, all the prostaglandins, thromboxanes, anyhow, that's about it. There we go. So let's move on to triglycerides. Um, I'm going to take a break here for a second and ask you guys something. Let me do this, this. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Are you guys, is anybody Fox. interested? Is anybody interested in taking a break? I can say no. You can say no? All right. I think this is, this is one time, this is a first, because normally I'm the one who doesn't want a break, and you guys are the one who wants it. And I think it's flipped around now. Because it's pretty tiring to be lecturing from home since I'm making all these videos. I'm talking like all day long. Can I just have like three minutes to go get a glass of water and I'll come right back? Well, as you would say, well, let's make it two instead. What's that? Well, normally you're like, I'll give you 10 minutes and you change your mind to like five minutes. So take it <laughs> all right, like three and, and, and a half. half. Okay. Three and a half minutes. Three and I, half. Just need to go, I just need to go get a, to get a drink of water. I'll be right back. Yeah. 
Has anyone been watching that Tiger show? Uh, yeah, it's yes. hilarious. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Yeah, I, saying I uh, binged it yesterday. It's uh, some oh amazing God. material. All, all I know is that last episode with the dude on the jet ski, that's the yeah. white trash thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, that was the white trash thing? <laughs> Just like they did the whole show, then you see this dude in fucking Florida riding his jet ski, just like, yeah, yeah I turned Dude. it all in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, it was pretty entertaining. All I know is Carol killed her husband, not a doubt in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where's the body? Uh, yeah. Especially when she's like, it's like they put like sardine oil on his shoes, you know, get him to eat him. Like, that was oddly specific. Carol. Yeah, how'd you know that, Carol? <laughs> Yeah, my uh, my roommate's watching it upstairs. I keep hearing it like chime in, and I'm just like, "Oh, it's such a ridiculous show." Oh man! <laughs> so, uh, so how's that quarantine going? That's uh, all right. I'm getting a lot of walks in. How about you? Oh, uh, me too. You know, just walk, walk the dog every day. Yeah. A lot of walks and a lot of honey do lists. I see no one else is uh, muted themselves or want to come back on camera. I see. <laughs> no, man, just been playing a lot of Xbox and oh. trying to stay busy. I mean, after this class, I'm jumping on Xbox. Like. <laughs> oh, yeah? What are you playing? Oh, I play bad games like PUBG. I, I might play Warzone, you know. I'll switch it up. Oh, you're on Warzone? I just got into that. I'm not super stellar at it. Uh, I just go get money. I'll do the plunder. <laughs> Here. Here you go. I'll send you my uh, Xbox name. Bam! Okay. I'll probably be playing after this as well. Got nothing else going on. I already did all my chores. Right. Oh, well, now I need to go get water. Okay. <laughs> so what's the Tiger Show about? Um, I'm seeing things about it, but I don't know what it's about at all. Documentary about this dude in Oklahoma who had, like, the world's largest, like, exotic cat zoo. He hired somebody to kill his rival in Florida, and it's just crazy. Just watch it. Just do yeah. it. Hi, is it good? It. I dove in yeah, on it's, it's, real good. it's really good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> normally, normally I don't like TV, but uh, new Ozarks out. Anyone watch that season three? Yeah, I heard it's good. Yeah, yeah it uh, looks good. I'm still on season one. You know what I mean? Oh, catch up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's a tiger see. show. I don't know if you noticed. There's a tiger show. <laughs> <laughs> so who's here? So. Gabby, are you there? I sure am, yeah. All right, great. And Will, you're there? Yep. Well, we got Danny. Hold on. You know, this is something. I'm just going to take a quick attendance, if you can just bear with me for a couple of seconds here. Bring up Chemistry 102. I, I, I don't have to do this, but i just like to know who's not here so I can contact them. Oh. Ba, 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 ba. And you guys, I can't say thank you enough for showing up to class. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you're sticking with it, which I know isn't easy to do. Um, so let's see. What's the date today? Shannon, are you in the garage? Don't judge me. We're on a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part about online class. We're on a break, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My dogs are loving it. It's all right. I'm like, yeah, I'm hanging out with my cat. See, yeah. <laughs> my dogs have really had separation anxiety, so yeah. it's like worse now. Yeah, you know. Hey, you, hey, you crazy cats and kittens. Hey, hey there, cats and kittens. <laughs> Is Elena on here? Oh, Elena's here. Good. This person's hey. not. Dan is here. Is Tony? I don't see he Tony. Was. He was? Was it he? Oh, no, that was my lab partner. Nope, never mind. Okay. No, he wasn't on. Is Shauna here? No. She's the one who was really struggling. 
<laughs> get on. Amelie? I thought I saw Amelie. No? Okay, Amelie's not here. Gabby's here. Abigail, not here. Vanessa, I know Vanessa's here. Yes. Um, Zach, uh, Danny, and is Samantha? Yep, Samantha. Hey, Samantha! Hey. Hey! My kids are here. Room, so it took me a minute. Oh, this is fantastic. That's great. So, did Danny, what did what Danny post help you? Uh, no, I didn't read anything yet. Uh, okay. You just figured it out? I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> All right. Anyhow, I'm just, we're just glad you're here. All right. That makes my day. Great. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm really happy. I'm glad you guys have chosen to show up. Um, so let's see here. Uh, where was I? Sharing my screen. There we go. Awesome. All right. And by the way, I know that some students have just decided, I mean, we've already heard this from the college, that some students have just decided to drop their courses, you know, because maybe they're too stressed or maybe they have an elderly loved one they need to take care of or just a family member, who knows? Literally, there could be Avogadro's number of reasons. So we understand that students are under a lot of pressure right now. Is anybody in our class still working at the moment? Yep. Yep. Yes. No. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I hope you're all be I hope you're all being careful out there. Eh, I mean work from home. Yeah. I'm surrounded yeah. by it, so I'm wearing so, all the PPE. <laughs> what yep. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, yes, a couple days ago my wife just said, like, um, she said, I need I need Chipotle now. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. You're pregnant. I, I can get you Chipotle. So I go to Chipotle and uh, I walk in and it's like this, you know, 17 year old girl alone in Chipotle. And I'm like, are you, you scared? And what's that? Anyhow, she was all alone. And I said, are you scared to be here? She's like, oh, what did she say? She's like, I'm not afraid to die or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of dramatic here. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I was hey. like, way to go. I was like, I like your, I like your personality. Hey, so, is essential. Yeah, right. Anyhow, let's um, let's move on. So, if you could mute your mics now, I'd appreciate it. If it comes out kind of kind of loud. All right. So, let's talk about section seventeen point three, which deals with glycerides. So, things like triglycerides and monoglycerides. All right. So, let me find something I want to get in here. All right, so triglycerides and monoglycerides. So it says here that the glycerides are lipid esters. So I told you that all kinds of different functional groups are going to come up. So, so, so far, we've already seen the carboxyl group from a carboxylic acid. Now we're going to take a look at esters, okay? So esters found um, on a glycerol backbone. And just to refresh your memory from a few minutes ago, so you'll remember that glycerol is... One, two, three, trihydroxypropane. Sometimes we draw it like this because it's just easier when you want to represent. Uh, it's easier to draw it that way, to draw a triglyceride. Anyhow, so the alcohol group from glycerol forms an ester with a fatty acid. So the esterification, so that esterification reaction between glycerol and an ester can occur at one, two, or all three of the alcohol positions to make a mono, a di, or a triglyceride. So a neutral triacylglyceride or a triglyceride. So um, sometimes we call these TGCs, right, for tri triglycerides. Anyhow, so triglycerides are non-ionic and non-polar. So they're not carboxylates or anything like that. So triglycerides serve as energy storage in fat cells, so adipose cells. So let's take a look at the structure and how we get to that structure. So glycerides, again, are lipid esters. So when you see a glyceride, you have to be aware that it's an ester. So it says here, a monoglyceride places a fatty acid chain at one alcohol group of glycerol. So this is my glycerol molecule. This is shown in all its gaudy detail, but if you just want to represent it 
There's a bond line structure like this. That's, these are the exact same thing. Okay, so I take that and I do an esterification reaction. So this is esterification. And, and I'm doing that esterification on this hydroxyl between the carboxyl group. And of course, I'm losing H2O and I form a monoglyceride. So if I do the same uh, esterification reaction, so again, this is esterification, okay? But if I do three equivalents of a carboxylic acid with my glycerol molecule, again, you could draw the glycerol like this. It's a lot faster to just draw it like that. What I end up with is a triglyceride. So if you are ever wondered what the heck is a triglyceride, it's nothing more than three, three esters on glycerol. That's all it is. But these R groups are going to be long, right? These are going to be long because they are the fatty portion, right? They're long hydrophobic chain. So fats and oils, you need to know the difference between fats and oils. Fats generally come from animals like uh, beef and you know, mutton and beer and things like that. And oil, these come from plants. And you've all heard of canola oil or hemp oil and things like that. So these come from plants. And there's a difference between them. So again, the triglycerides or triacylglycerols are a combination of glycerol and fatty acid. But the types of fatty acids are what we're going to use to differentiate between fats and oils. So again, fats come from animals and they are going to be solids at room temperature. So if you've ever, again, like uh, cooked a hamburger or something like that, and sometimes people will strain off the fat, what happens to that fat overnight is it solidifies, right? It gets hard. Or if you've ever, you know, uh, seen deer meat or something like that, like the fat in the deer, it almost marbles. It gets really hard so much that you can break it off when it's cold. Whereas oils like canola oil, those are liquids at room temperature. So it's always going to be free flowing. And the reason why is because oils are unsaturated. They have unsaturated fatty acid tails. So tristerin is a fat. And you can see that the fatty acid chains, you see how they're all linear on here? So what that means is that if I have two or three or four or Avogadro's number of molecules of tristerin, they're going to stack more efficiently then if I have something like trioleum, which is an oil, okay, and the reason why it's a liquid room temperature is because these molecules are not going to pack as effectively, right? Because these kinks here in the fatty acid chains, these come from the double bonds, okay? So that's why unsaturated fats in plants have double bonds. So there we go. So a little bit more about the reaction. So triglycerides have the typical ester and alkene chemical properties as they are composed of those two groups. So fatty acid reaction. So of course, esterification, right? We can form an ester between the carboxyl group of a fatty acid and the hydroxyl of an alcohol like glycerol. So, and then hydrogenation, uh, that saturates the double bond. So you can actually take uh, an unsaturated fat like this and you can actually hydrogenate all those double bonds that are in there. And if you're like, well, does that mean hydrogenation? You mean like hydrogen and palladium, platinum, or nickel? The answer is yes. So that's how you do it. Um, and then also you can hydrolyze a triglyceride. So you can hydrolyze them back to the fatty acid and back to glycerol. So the way that we do that is using saponification. And what saponification is, now we looked at saponification in terms of just one ester and breaking that apart to um, a carboxylate in an alcohol, but so was actually made from, it came from animal fat, right? And soaps that we use, generally speaking, come from animal fats. So here's esterification. And I get some good news for you. This should be reviewed to everybody in that's online with us right now. So this is a question that I would have asked you on the last exam. Give me an example of esterification. So you take an, an, a carboxylic acid and you treat it with an alcohol. You heat that up, you lose water, and you form an ester. I can't stress this enough. If you don't know esterification by the time you come out of this class, you're in trouble. You have to know esterification. It's just, and if you're like, well, why are you bringing it up again? Okay, didn't we already learn it once? Because before we talked about small carboxylic acids, but now we're talking about fatty acids. So this is something that's really interesting. So hydrogenation. So again, if you've ever heard of these, those, you know, 
contains partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. So let me explain what that means. Okay, so hydrogenation is an addition reaction, right? What's addition mean? It means we're adding something to a molecule. So an example of hydrogenation that we would have seen before is taking something like trans to butene, and then we treated it with hydrogen and nickel, let's say, and then we ended up with butane. So we went from an alkene to an alkene. And the reason it's called an addition reaction is because we added H2 across the molecule. So what happens though is that an unsaturated fatty acid can be converted into a saturated uh, um, fatty acid. So what they do is they actually take an oil, so something with linoleic acid, or linoleic acid which has one, two double bonds. So they'll take this, which is a liquid, okay, and they'll subject it to the conditions of hydrogenation, stir it around under hydrogen, with nickel as a catalyst, you're like, what, that's in my food? The answer is yes, okay? Not nickel, obviously, but we use nickel as a catalyst, and they stir it around until it solidifies, right? So they add two hydrogens here and two hydrogen atoms there, and they convert it into things like stearic acid. I still don't know why. I still haven't figured out why it does that sometimes. Anyhow, so let's move on from there. So here's an example. So I took this from another book, so I teach this, or this slide comes from just another organic chemistry textbook. But you see here that this is an unsaturated fat, right? Because I have a double bond here, I have another one here, another one here, another one here. And what they're doing is they're treating this with hydrogenation conditions, so H2 in a catalyst. And again, it could be palladium, platinum, or nickel. Nickel is really commonly used in the food industry. Anyhow, but the unsaturated fat, this is going to be a liquid. And then the saturated fat is going to be a solid. And it's because of the more efficient packing, right? When we have a saturated fat versus an unsaturated fat. So that's what hydrogenation is. So the way that things like margarine are made, right? Butter has a really difficult, or when butter is cold, I should say, its consistency is very difficult to spread, right? You always put a hole in your toast. So the way that margarine is made is they take oil, vegetable oil, and then they hydrogenate it, but they stir it around and around and around until it gets to just the right consistency where it becomes spreadable even when it's cold. Anyhow, kind of an interesting thing here. Now, if you've wondered, well, what about trans fats? Where are they coming from? Well, what happens is when they subject an unsaturated um, uh, fat to hydrogenation conditions, what happens is some of the time, one of those cis bonds can be converted into a trans, and that's called an isomerization. So it's not an addition, you're just like switching it. It's going from cis, if you can see my hands, I have my two hands on the same side, right, and they're flipping. And what happens is that trans fats are made during hydrogenation. So these are man made during the hydrogenation process, and trans fats have been linked apparently to raised cholesterol levels, which is, you know, directly correlated to atherosclerosis, supposedly, or hardening of the arteries or heart disease, right? So that's where trans fats come from, and that's what a trans fat is. So trans fats aren't natural. They're made during the synthesis of things like margarine. Anyhow, so let's talk about the hydrolysis of a glyceride, of a triglyceride. So again, you recognize this reaction here. So if I take um, an ester in water and I do a hydrolysis in acid, I end up with an acid and an alcohol, right? If I do it in base, then I end up with a carboxylate, and that's saponification, but this is acid hydrolysis. So saponification is the base catalyzed hydrolysis of an ester. This should be nothing more than review to you, okay? You end up with an alcohol and a carboxylic acid salt, right? So we call this sometimes, we call this a carboxylate, carboxylate salt, um, which is a soap. So if you're wondering what soaps are, a soap is just a carboxylate salt with a long tail. So what happens is the carboxylate salts, they all kind of aggregate together and they form what are called micelles. And the micelles dissolve the oil and the dirt particles. So if I take a look at the saponification reaction, again, this is nothing new to you, but this is what an actual soap. So if you have a bar of Irish spring or something or ivory soap, they, they, this is the kind of molecule that it's made of. So it has this long nonpolar hydro, uh, hydrophobic group here and this tiny hydro, um, hydrophilic carboxylate 
head. So what happens is if you have, you know, a lot of these, is that they're going to, uh, like I said, they're going to aggregate together where the polar group is going to be on the outside facing the water, right? And then this part is going to be used to dissolve your dirt and your oils and your greases and things like that. Grease. There we go. So hard water, I'm never going to ask you about hard water. Well, maybe I could ask you a multiple choice question about it. Anyhow, um, and so when hard water is used with soap, so I don't know if anybody's ever lived in a house where there's hard water before. It's pretty miserable. And my aunt and uncle had a horrible well and they had, they had really bad hard water problems. It always left like the scum around the sinks and everything, even if they were very clean people. What happens is that the hard water contains calcium ions and magnesium ions, which aren't really deleterious to your health or anything. But what happens is when those carboxylate salts from soaps, when they bind to um, the calcium or the magnesium, they form these fatty acid salts. And these kind of salts, they actually precipitate out, right? And that's manifested, right? They're solid. So it, it doesn't, it makes the, the soap not as effective, right? Because it doesn't emulsify. And that's what leaves soap scum. So I hope nobody's ever experienced that. It's pretty miserable. But growing up in Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia is surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. So there's all kinds of veins of iron and calcium running through the bedrock everywhere. And so a lot of people have crummy wells. Anyhow, so let's move on to phosphoglycerides. So you can probably guess what the term phosphoglyceride is. It's some kind of lipid that has phosphorus in it. And you would be absolutely correct by, you know, if you, if you guess that. So it says here, phospholipid is a more general term for any lipid that contains phosphorus, whereas a phosphoglyceride, on the other hand, is um, a molecule that contains glycerol, which we've looked at, you know, several times this evening. Sorry, I lost my chat. So glycerol, and then it's going to have fatty acid. I should say fatty acids. And then it's going to have some kind of phosphoric acid with an amino alcohol bonded to it as well. And I'll show you, I'll show you what this part is in a second here. So you're basically, try glyceride. You had one fatty acid, a second fatty acid, then you had a third. So uh, phosphoglyceride, you're basically just replacing one of the fatty acids with this phosphoric acid linked to an amino alcohol. And the two types of uh, amino alcohols we're mainly um, going to look at are going to be choline and, and um, uh, what else are we going to look at? Um, look at it in another slide, I guess. Anyhow, so uh, phosphoglyceride properties. So Here's an example of a, of a phosphoglyceride um, that I had shown here. So they have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic domains. So of course, um, this whole green portion, so um, the hydrophobic portion, this would be the portion that's in, I need a pen here. That's the portion that's in green, right? There's all these carbon hydrogen bonds in there. And then of course you have the hydrophilic portion so the hydrophilic portion would be this portion here, right? Because I have oxygens with negative charges on them. So the thing about phosphoglycerides is that they are found in cell membranes. So it says membranes, and when it says membranes, it means cell membranes. Cell membranes are actually very complex. They're also used as emulsifying agents. So what that means is when they sus are suspended in water, they spontaneously rearrange into these ordered structures where all the hydrophobic groups go in towards the center and the hydrophilic groups go out towards the water. And that's what helps, and that's what the basis of membrane structure is. So the phosphoglyceride, again, if you go back to something that you might have seen in biology class, right? You see those circles with the tails that you've seen in biology class in the cell membrane? Well, this is the circle, and these are the tails down here, okay? So that's what the phospho glyceride is. And they talk about the phospholipid bilayer. Now you're getting exposed to what a phospholipid is. But there's more than one type of phospholipid. So um, these are the two types. Yeah. So there's ones that are made with choline, the molecule of choline, which is shown down here, and other ones made with lecithin. So do I have the structure of lecithin in here? I thought I did. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. So this is a lecithin down here. Anyhow, I'll show you in a second. So, 
Ones that are made with choline are called lecithin, and the ones that are made with ethanolamine or serine are called cephalin. So choline gives you a lecithin, and the ones that are made with serine, so I'm sorry, ethanol or serine are called cephalin. They're getting tired. But anyhow, so let's move on from there. So let me just show you some examples here. So these are just showing you different types of phosphoglycerides. So it says the simplest, so if you look at the text over here, it says the simplest phosphoglyceride contains a free phosphoryl group and is known as a phosphatidate. Okay, so that's this one here. So this is a, this is a phosphatidate. Okay, so I'll ban it and thing here. Anyhow, so what happens is if I, add different groups to it. So you can see that this one here is lecithin, okay? And what I added to it is choline, which is this molecule here. So you can see the tri, you know, the trimethyl coming off of the nitrogen here. So this is a lecithin, and then this one here is a cephalin, and then the one over here, this is called a phosphatidyl uh, serine. This has a serine molecule on the end here. Anyhow, if you're wondering what the take home message is, I think I'm digging around in the weeds here a little bit. I'm going into too much detail. All you have to know is that these are examples of phospholipids. So what do they have in common, right? They all have a hydrophilic portion at the end and they all have two fatty acid tails coming off the end like that. With that in mind, I thought I would take, just give me a second here and look at a couple of things. Yeah, we could talk about non glyceride lipids for a few seconds here. So, non glyceride lipids, so these are lipids that don't have glycerol as part of the backbone, right? If you go back here, right, we saw we had, right, we have our glycerol backbone here, right? We have it in all of these, we had it in all the triglycerides. But these molecules are not going to have glycerol as part of the backbone. So non-glyceride lipids. So the first one we're going to look at are called sphingolipids. And they're based off of this molecule down here, sphingosine, kind of a funny name. And you don't have to memorize. Obviously, don't have to know the structure of sphingosine. It's really complex. But what do you have to know? It's got a long chain, and it has a nitrogen in the molecule. And it also has two alcohols in it as well. It says here it's an amphipathic molecule. Amphipathic is just a fancy word that tells us it's got hydrophobic and hydrophilic portions, right? The hydrophobic portion is all of this down here, right? And then the hydrophilic portion, the hydrophilic portion is obviously these part portions down here. So again, it's got that polar head group up here, and then it has that big fatty acid tail. So you see a lot of similarities. So sphingolipid sphingo categories. So again, just like the phosphoglycerides, sphingolipids are uh, a component of cellular membranes. We probably don't talk about them as much in biology class, but they are an important part of uh, biological uh, cell membranes. So the major categories are the sphingomyelins and the glycosphingolipids. So um, sphingomyelins, you can probably guess these are found in the myelin sheath. And glycosphingolipids, you can probably guess that they contain sugars. So here's an example of a sphingomyelin. So again, we have our sphingosine backbone. But what do we have in a sphingomyelin is that we have a fatty acid coming off of the nitrogen. And then we have this uh, phosphocholine group coming off one of the hydroxyls like that. What's the take home message going to be about a sphingolipid? The same thing that we're seeing over and over and over again. That the fatty acid tail, right, is going to be a long tail that they didn't draw. So we're going to have two long tails and then we're going to have a polar head group. So a sphingolipid is going to have that polar head group and it's going to have two tails. So a little bit more information about that um, phospholipid bilayer. So I'm going to skip the part about sphingomyelins. You should just know that they are found in what's known as the myelin sheath, which are um, uh, uh, essential for proper cerebral function. Nothing more than that. 
And then glycosphingolipids, I don't remember ever asking anything about those except for the fact that they contain sugar molecules. So it even says here, don't worry about self sulfatides or gangliosides. Or sorry, sulfatides, gangliosides. Anyhow, so I wanted to move on. I'm never going to ask you anything about Tay-Sachs disease or Gaucher's disease. It even says right here, for personal interest only. Um, but I did want to talk about steroids before we end the class because steroids are important, especially for anybody who wants to write a HESI exam, which I think a couple of people are interested in writing in the future. So if you're going into nursing, you probably won't see any questions about sphingomyelins on the HESI exam, but you might see a question about steroids. So steroids are synthesized from what's called an isoprene unit. And if you remember, I showed you the isoprene unit when we looked at things like um, limonene and oil of bayberry and things like that. So isoprene units are kind of like a brick, okay? Isoprene, um, if I draw the structure of isoprene, it's just this molecule. So it's got one, two, three, four, five carbons in it. So it's complicated to see how steroids are built from isoprene. So since isoprene has five carbons, generally speaking, um, steroids will have a multiple of five carbons. So they usually have 20 carbons. And then anyhow, so they're part of a diverse collection of lipi, uh, lipids that we call isoprenoids or terpenes. So they contain a steroids carbon skeleton, which is a collection of four fused rings. So if you notice these two structures that you see down here, this one and this one, they're, they're the same. They have this ABCD ring system. And if you remember, I drew this at the very beginning of the class. You need to know this. Everybody who studies Chemistry 102 has to know about you have a six membered ring tied to another six membered ring, a six membered ring on the upper right, and then a five membered ring attached to that. All steroids, whether they're anabolic steroids or whether it's a drug that's used as a contraceptive, they all have that as part of their framework. And we call that the steroid nucleus. It's not the nucleus of an atom, we just call it a steroid nucleus. Anyhow, where would you see the steroid nucleus? Well, cholesterol is actually a steroid. So there are more steroids besides anabolic steroids, right? Everybody is aware of those because they're illegal and people use them to, you know, get big muscles or whatever. But cholesterol is a steroid, right? And you can see the steroid skeleton here. You can see the one six-membered ring, another six-membered ring, this six-membered ring on the upper right. And then, of course, we have the five-membered ring here. And, of course, there are other carbons in it, too. But cholesterol is a steroid. It's found in cell membranes and it's a really important part of animal cell membranes. It's the precursor to what are known as bile salts, the sex hormones like estrogen, um, uh, testosterone, vitamin D, um, and it has been linked to atherosclerosis. Now this is something that we could sit here and argue about all day. I, got into, I was camping with a couple other families a few Summers ago, when a guy went on this huge tirade, how cholesterol had nothing to do with heart disease. So who knows? But yeah, something kind of interesting there. So I want to stop there um, with just looking at the steroid skeleton. I wanted to show you that before Wednesday. And where we're ending, um, I think that next class, we should be able to wrap this chapter up quite easily. So we'll be able to wrap this chapter up on Wednesday, April 1st. And then I'll, I want to get into protein structure and function. So hopefully um, you're getting a flavor for the fact that I'm not going over things in as great a detail as I was in the face-to-face -face class. And if you came into our conversation or you logged in a little bit later than everybody else, I just want to remind you one more time, this is something I'm not going to say in an announcement. Um, ba, 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 ba. Uh, presenting, here we go. Go to application. Where am I? There I am. So again, for the people who showed up late to class, which no problem at all, but I just want to tell you, and again, I'm not going to put this in an exam or in an announcement, but I just want you to be fully aware that I, I'm, I'm completely um, aware of what you're all going through now. I know for some people it might be easy. I'm sure for somebody in our class, I'm sure that somebody is finding it really difficult. The whole thing with you're being isolated. Um, it's very difficult for me. 
for, you know, Abigail's number of reasons. Again, like I said at the beginning of the class, if there's one thing I'm learning is that everybody has got some kind of story. And now that I've heard that many of you are actually working, so that adds an extra layer of stress and complication to your lives. And I just want you to know that I'm aware of that. And um, I can't say that I understand it, but I'm aware of it. So again, I'm not 